I would uh, feel a lot less pressure if it were satisfactory Sundays as opposed to sensational Sundays. So, uh, I want to thank you all for coming. It's quite an audience today. A uh, whole range of um, ages, and I suspect expertise and familiarity with Adam Smith. We've heard, my wife and I were sort of eavesdropping as people came in, and we heard people talking about having to write reports for school, as well as talking about Adam Smith's books themselves. So there will be people to keep me honest, both in my ability to explain myself and to keep the facts in order. And so I appreciate that. Obviously, after the discussion, there'll be plenty of time to ask questions. And, and then there's coffee and some other things uh, upstairs afterwards. I want to prepare you for the presentation a little bit because for some of you who are not used to philosophy, there are going to be a lot of words. Uh, as a philosopher, I think how to read the text is incredibly important because what we're going to be doing is a process of interpretation. It's not just me telling you what Adam Smith says, but I'm going to present you with some of his writing and I'm going to present you with my interpretation, but I also want you to have the opportunity to read it and see perhaps maybe my understanding is incorrect. And so I'm happy to meet any challenges that you have. I also want to warn you that because there's a fair amount of text, different people will get different information out of it. And what I mean by that is, this is Smith's books are the kind of books like the Constitution of the United States, like the Bible, like great literature that you have to read a dozen times before you really get the sense of everything that's being said, if that's ever possible. And so some people who, this is the first exposure to Adam Smith, will only get a little bit out of each slide, and other people will get more. And that's part of the fun of philosophy. Part of the fun of philosophy is that each time you look at it, each time you read it, each time you think about it, you discover more, you learn more. I want to start off by having us think about the world we live in. I want us to start off by thinking about capitalism as we experience it. Because there's so many things that we take for granted about capitalism. There's so many things we take for granted about the rules and the ways we interact with one another. How we dress, how we communicate ideas, what's expected of us. Um, my wife and I were looking for a place to eat breakfast this morning before the presentation. <laughs> And every place we went was an all-you-could-eat buffet. There was no place to eat a comfortable amount. Right? Or, you know, as, as I said to, to Jan, um, I didn't want to do that because I figured that I didn't want all of you to watch me sleep for two hours on the stage. So an all-you-could-eat buffet is a conception of what's good and what's not. More is better. Intensity is better. The ability to consume as much as you can is often regarded as better. And so it was an interesting sort of transition into thinking today, what other options could there have been if there had been a restaurant, and there may be, we're not from Bismarck, so we don't know all of our options, but if there had been a restaurant that offered a light but intensely flavored brunch, would that do well? <laughs> If there had been a restaurant that had offered a perfectly situated to your body size restaurant, <laughs> would that have done well? What is it about more that is better? In the uh, essay that I write summarizing the discussion, I talk a little bit about the Bring Christ Back into Christmas movement this past winter. It struck me as interesting. Because in the past, bring Christ into Christmas movements have been about sacrifice, have been about working at soup kitchens instead of giving gifts, giving donations instead of giving gifts, trying to find the religious, charity, spiritual core of the holiday. But this last winter, which I'm sure many of you remember, there was a national controversy because there was a group that was trying to tell us that we should shop only at places that say Merry Christmas when you shop there. They shouldn't, you shouldn't go to places that say Happy Holidays or Seasons Greetings. That by not saying Merry Christmas, we are violating the spirit of the holiday. Now notice, as I talk about in the essay, what this message is. 
The first is charity has disappeared. Right? It's not about donating your gifts. It's not about donating your money. It's not about donating your time. It's not about helping your fellow person. It's about marketing. It's about slogans. It's about communicating a message to exclude or eclipse other messages. The thing about capitalism is capitalism is in inherently, for lack of a better term, Darwinian. It's about succeeding over others. Not just succeeding yourself, but succeeding over others. And so for this group, and of course this group does not speak for every Christian group in the country, but for this group, to succeed was not only to have a successful Christmas themselves, but also to have their Christmas eclipse all other holidays at the time, whether they were Jewish holidays or Muslim holidays or Buddhist holidays or Hindu holidays. We live in a society in which capitalism and democracy have become synonymous. And the place in our pop culture where this is most evident is in the words of the character Gordon Gekko, from the 1987 movie, Wall Street. It's a wonderful, interesting movie, not just because all of the clothes and the way that they act are so 1980s that it's really a flashback, but in talking to a bunch of uh, investors, while Gecko is trying to uh, take over the company, he gives the speech, and the speech reads as follows. The point is, ladies and gentlemen, that greed, for lack of a better word, is good. Greed is right. Greed works. Greed clarifies, cuts through, and captures the essence of the evolutionary spirit. There's that Darwinian term again. Greed in all of its forms, greed for life, for money, for knowledge, has marked the upward surge of mankind. Greed, you mark my words, will save this malfunctioning corporation called the USA. And notice what he does. In addition to justifying his actions, and in addition to suggesting that we have to make more money, which, you know, may not be bad. I would certainly like to make more money. Um, he is equating greed, greed and he's making greed the metaphor for all of the things that we traditionally separate from greed. Greed for life. Greed for knowledge. He calls the United States a corporation, a business. Aren't there more things that we want? in our picture of life. Aren't there more ideas? Do we want love to be a matter of greed? Do we want life, living, all aspects of living to be a matter of greed? Do we want the United States to be a business? Notice, it's not a community. It's not a family. It's a corporation. Is that what we want? And so the next question, the question that, of course, I'm here to help discuss is, how do we get here? How do we get to the point where greed becomes such an overarching metaphor and the, march, uh, and the, the market becomes such an overarching metaphor that everything else gets defined in terms of greed? No surprise, I'm going to suggest that part of the answer is Adam Smith. Adam Smith was a Scottish philosopher. Notice I said philosopher, not economist. Adam Smith was a Scottish philosopher born in the 18th century. He lived among some of the greatest thinkers of the modern world. He lived at the same time as Immanuel Kant. He was best friends with David Hume. He knew Benjamin Franklin. Thomas Jefferson read his work. In The Wealth of Nations, his great work, he in fact talks about the American colonies. The Wealth of Nations was published in 1776, at roughly the same time that the Declaration of Independence was written. The Wealth of Nations is a book about political economy. Political economy is a discipline that we don't have in the States very much anymore. It involves sociology and anthropology and economics and philosophy and a whole bunch of other disciplines. The main purpose of the Wealth of Nations was to challenge mercantilism. Mercantilists believe that the wealth of a nation could be measured by how much money was in its borders at any one time. That you, in order to see how rich a country was, you counted up all the bank accounts. You counted up all the pocket change. You counted up all the money that was in the mattresses that people were hiding, and you got a number, and that's how wealthy a country was. 
Mercantilists, by definition, were anti-trade. They didn't want us to trade with other countries because when you trade with other countries, your money leaves the country and goes to another country. And that's bad. So mercantilists were what we now call protections. This is the same debate that is involved, is involved in NAFTA and CAFTA and steel uh, trade and all of these other discussions that we're having now. Is it better to keep our money in the country or is it better to spread it out? Smith suggests the latter. Smith says that the true wealth of a nation is not to be measured by the amount of money that's in the nation, but rather the potential of the nation to convert goods and services into money. In other words, labor. Smith thought that the value, the wealth of a nation could be measured by the amount of labor. The more work, the more jobs, the more money, the more wealth. Smith was pro-trade, free trade, because the more we trade, the more there's need for our goods, the more need for our goods, the more money. So the first thing we have to understand is that Smith was responding specifically to a very political debate. He's responding to something else, which we'll talk about in a little bit. But for the time being, what makes Wealth of Nations special and what often gets misrepresented is Smith's focus on self-interest. Smith writes, this is perhaps the most famous passage of Smith. It is not from the benevolence of the butcher, the brewer, and the baker that we expect our dinner, but from regard to their own interest. We address ourselves not to their humanity, but to their self-love, and never talk to them of their own necessities, but of their own advantages. So I want some food. I want a loaf of bread. I don't walk up to the baker and say, you're a nice person, I'm a nice person. Give me a loaf of bread. <laughs> I say, if you give me a loaf of bread, I will give you something. I will give you money. I will give you shoes. I will give you what have you. You can have a wonderful life, and I can have a wonderful life. And so we get bread from the baker by catering to their self-interest, by catering to their personal needs. Smith then brings up the concept of the invisible hand. This is the other very famous aspect of the wealth of nations. The invisible hand is a concept used to direct, it's a, it's a substitute for progress, ultimately. Smith writes, an economic actor neither intends to promote the public interest nor knows how he is promoting it. He intends only his own gain. That, of course, right there is self-interest. And he is in this, as in many other cases, led by an invisible hand to promote an end which was no part of his intention. By pursuing his own interests, self-interest again, he frequently promotes that of society more effectively than when he really intends to promote it. So what Smith is telling us to do is to not worry about anyone else. Don't worry about your neighbor. Don't worry about caring for anyone else. Don't worry about social engineering. Don't worry about what's best for the community. Worry about yourself, and the invisible hand will take care of the rest. Taken together, these concepts are very difficult, are very, lead very much to the concept of greed. So how is it, given the fact that I've just presented two quotes from Smith that seem to argue exactly what Gordon Gekko was arguing, how do we, how do I defend my argument that this is not what Smith had in mind? Well, the first thing we do is we have to look at his first book, The Theory of Moral Sentiments. It's worth noting that the title of the second book is An Inquiry into the Nature and Cause of the Wealth of Nations. The beginning of the title is an indefinite article. It's one of many. It's an inquiry into. But Smith here is giving us the theory of moral sentiment. It's a definite article. It's more certainty. We can rely on it more. It was published in 1759, when Smith was a chair of moral philosophy at Glasgow University. It was incredibly popular. It was incredibly popular in the way that the Da Vinci Code has been incredibly popular, in the way that self-help books are incredibly popular. It was not only read in schools, it was read by all of the people who, who thought that reading the popular intellectual book was part of, was essential to their self-image. It was 
he had a huge following of women who loved to talk to him about his theories. Theory of moral sentiments was built on what he called sympathy, the process of fellow feeling. You feel a certain feeling, I watch you, I learn why you feel that way, and I feel the same thing. That sympathy, the process of me understanding your emotions and developing a, uh, a similar emotion, or as he calls it, an analogous emotion. He also argues that people are expected to care about others. They're supposed to care for others, that we are a community first and foremost, and that in order to be who we are, we have to pay attention to who the others are that are around us. Now, this sounds very, very different than The Wealth of Nations. The first, sorry, the second book talks about greed, self, sorry, self-interest and the invisible hand and paying attention to your own needs. The first, the earlier one, talks about caring for others. So it's not all that surprising that we get in the 19th century a puzzle called the Adam Smith problem, and actually it was German uh, writers that developed it, so it's actually called Das Adam Smith Problem, which is not very hard to translate. <laughs> the Adam Smith problem has often been written off as a translation mistake, and that's part of it. They read sympathy, they, ha they hear care, they hear altruism. What they argue, I gave away my punchline already, but I can't go back on this fancy thing. So. Um, what they argue is that theory of moral sentiments and the wealth of nations are simply incompatible. Smith, for whatever reason, split personality, changing his mind, whatever motivation he had, the two books cancel each other out, and the wealth of nations, obviously the more successful, capitalism is on the rise. So let's throw away the theory of moral sentiments. Their mistake, though, was that they thought that sympathy was altruism. It wasn't. Sympathy does not say, I only care about you. I'll explain why in a moment. Rather, sympathy is what we would term empathy. I care about your feelings and I feel for you, whether positive or negative. And sympathy is the foundation for moral judgment. We'll talk about this again in a moment. They also understood the term, misunderstood the term self-interest. Self-interest is not selfishness. It is not egoism. If I'm hungry and I eat a bologna sandwich, I'm not being selfish. I need to take care of myself. I need to feed my body. I'm self-interested because I'm caring about my own interest, but I'm not being selfish. If, however, I'm hungry and I take all of the bologna sandwiches in the room and don't let anyone else have a bologna sandwich, even though it's more than I can eat, then I'm being selfish. And what the uh, 19th century interpreters misunderstood was that self-interest does not preclude the interest of other people. Selfishness meant. The Adam Smith problem was part translation to say, but it was also motivated in part by fear of individuality and fear of political consequences because what they thought was that all of these capitalists, the Adam Smith school, they were going to take over all the corporations, they were going to take over all the factories, and other people would lose. And so they wanted to destroy the father of this theory. They wanted to destroy the theory to stop people from being motivated by it. And capitalism promotes individuality. And in the 19th century, particularly in the German world, there was a rise in the power of community over the individual. And so as capitalism, as individualism overrides that, they have to destroy that notion. I, I thought there was a slide. So Smith is Scottish. And for those who are geographically challenged like myself, Scotland is uh, on the western part of Europe, part of the United Kingdom, and right up there. So hop aboard. Um, Scott was, excuse me, Smith was, one of a whole school of philosophers called the Scottish Enlightenment. The Enlightenment is the period of time when European philosophers 
sought to make reason the dominant conception of how we engage in inquiry. Following the Middle Ages, following the Reformation, following the Renaissance, science, art, secularism became the central motivating force in inquiry following Isaac Newton, the notion that uh, Isaac Newton postulated that the laws of the heavens were the same as the laws of the earth. Following all of this, the Enlightenment philosophers wanted to argue that human reason was the great tool for knowledge. The Scots were more complicated than that, though. And the Scots were constantly looking at the interaction between emotion and reason, between art and science, between religion and science. And Smith was one of these group of people who all talked to each other, who all knew each other. It was a small country. They called themselves the literati. They would meet in clubs. Uh, and, and I don't mean you know, dance clubs with lights and stuff. Uh, they, you know, they, they would meet in the back of pubs, in the back of bars, and talk philosophy with each other. They also meant to challenge the work of Bernard Men. Bernard Mandeville published a book called The Fable of the Bees, subtitled Private Vices, Public Benefits, in 1714. And when people read it, they freaked out. It was as if the Antichrist himself had come and published a book. In France, they burned the book. They prohibited people from reading it. And every philosopher of the time, every Scottish philosopher, wanted to challenge Mandeville's approach. What was it that Mandeville said was so shocking? He asked this question. He asked, let us be just. What benefit can peace, concord, family, virtue, and charity be of? On what earthly good can they do to promote the wealth, the glory, and the worldly greatness of nations? We see, of course, the title of the wealth of nations implicit in that quote. Mandeville is suggesting that virtue does not give us wealth. Virtue, charity, peace, concord, family, these do not give us conceptions of a strong society, of a strong economy. He says instead that it is the sensual courtier that sets no limits to his luxury. The fickle strumpet, I love his language, the fickle strumpet that invents new fashions every week the haughty duchess that in equipage entertainments and all her behavior would imitate a princess. The profuse rake and lavish air that scatter about their money without wit or judgment buy everything they see and either destroy it or give it away the next day. It is these that are to procure an honest livelihood to the vast multitudes of working poor. If we were suddenly not consumers, if we stop buying new shoes and new sweaters, new CDs, if we stop going to the all-you-can-eat buffet, if we stop changing our fashions, if we stop buying a new car every time we could, all these people would be out of work. And what Mandeville is telling us is that for a powerful economy, charity, virtue, family don't mean anything at all. Consumption is what motivates a strong and healthy economy. Now you can imagine, even in the modern day, even when our most, our most free market oriented politicians say free market and family values in the same sentence, we still find this a little shocking. And that's why the politicians say family values in the sense is a free market. Because these politicians will never say, even if they believe it, family values are not important. Caring for your family is not important. What's important is buying things. Buy, 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 buy. And that's, of course, why, as I said in the essay, after September 11th, after the tragedy of September 11th, President Bush said to America, become normal again, go out and shop. And of course, as I say in my essay, he was right. Because in our society, in our society, if we stop shopping, we lose jobs. If we stop watching television commercials and we stop buying things, we're a service economy these days. What happens?
happens when we stop going to restaurants. So Smith, amongst all of the others, wants to respond to this issue. And he responds first by reminding us that human beings are social beings. He says, were it possible that a human creature could grow up to manhood in some solitary place without any communication with his own species, he could no more think of his own character, of the propriety or demerit of his own sentiments and conduct, of the beauty or deformity of his own mind than the beauty and deformity of his own face. There's a typo there. Which I thought I fixed, but apparently I did not. Um, I want you to think for a second about your mother and father. I want you to think what it would be like if you ha didn't have a mother and father. Now, obviously, if you had no mother or father, you wouldn't be here today. But suppose your mother and father said, what's important is that my child be an individual. What's important is that my child take care of his or herself. Therefore, I've just given birth to this child. I'm going to put it down in the park. And if it wants to survive, it's got to go get a job on its own. We don't work like that. We are dependent animals. We need other people. And we need other people not only to feed us and clothe us when we're young, but to help us see what our moral decisions should be, to help us see what beautiful is, would help us see what kindness is. We are social creatures. And if, in response to Mandeville, Smith says, we need one another for more than just shopping, then he's already started to whittle at, away at Mandeville's plan. Therefore, theory of moral sentiments is not egoistic. For those of you who don't know, uh, I know there are some, some uh, high school students in the room. Altruism is the belief that a moral act gets its value only from helping others, that a truly moral act has no self-interest whatsoever. If I gain happiness from it, if I gain benefit from it, it's not moral because it's not altruistic. Saints are an example of truly altruistic people if we assume that they're not trying to get into heaven. <laughs> it's always that part, right? Egoism is the moral belief that are the belief that people are only concerned with themselves. They don't care about anyone else for any reason whatsoever. The condemnation that people have, that the, those who put forth the Adam Smith problem have, of, of, of the wealth of nations was that it was egoistic. Theory of moral sentiments is not egoistic. The wealth of nations, we will see, is not egoistic. What Smith is doing is putting forth a moral psychology. What he's trying to do is to describe how moral people act. He says in the theory of moral sentiments that this is not a matter of right, it is a matter of fact, meaning I am not going to tell you how things should be. I'm going to tell you how things are. Philosophy often plays two different roles, the prescriptive role and the descriptive role. The prescriptive role prescribes things, tells us how things ought to be. The descriptive role tells us how things are. And he wants to describe a problem in a very, very telling aspect of the human experience. Right? When you're a philosopher, you get to use phrases like the human experience. He suggests the following thought experiment. Let us suppose that the great empire of China, with all its myriads of inhabitants, was suddenly swallowed up by an earthquake. And let us consider how a man of humanity in Europe, who had no sort of connection, 18th century spelling, not a typo, no sort of connection with that part of the world would be affected upon receiving intelligence of this dreadful calamity. So, he suggests, you're reading a newspaper. There's this huge earthquake in China. Millions and millions of people, and at this point, a billion people, are swallowed up into the earth. How would you react? He says, people would be People would gasp in horror. If they were philosophical, they would think about what kind of God creates this world. They would lament for a little while. They would talk about it over coffee. But we'd go about our business. 
We go about our daily business of eating our food, of going to our job, of changing the diapers of our children, of watching Survivor or Desperate Housewives. We do all of these different things. But imagine the next day, this is his example still, you were to cut off your little finger in an accident, you're chopping wood or something, or, 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 or slicing bologna for those sandwiches. And you'd cut off your little finger. How we would moan and complain and groan and cry out, oh my god, my life is over, my little finger, my life is horrible. And we'd complain and we'd lose sleep over it, and we'd spend the next two weeks with this bandage talking about how rough life is because we've lost our little finger. But, Smith, Suppose someone would say, okay, you get your little finger back. But in order to get your little finger back, you have to sacrifice all of the people in China. A billion people for your own little finger. Smith says, somewhat optimistically, a, such a monster has never been seen in humanity. No human being would ever sacrifice a billion people for their little finger, even though they go about their business when they read one in the newspaper and they moan and groan about the finger. So Smith asks a question now. What makes this difference? When our passive feelings are almost always so sordid and so selfish, how comes it that our active principles should often be so generous and so noble? When we are always so much more deeply affected by whatever concerns ourselves, then by whatever concerns other men, what is it which prompts the generous upon all occasions and the mean upon many to sacrifice their own interests to the greatest interest of others? Mean it. If it's the case that we will moan and groan so much about the finger, why is it that we don't sacrifice the people for the finger? What is this imbalance of the human experience that our passive feelings, our feelings of sorrow for others, are so inactive? But when the choice comes, when the chance comes to make the choice, we wouldn't do that. Now this seems to be a harsh picture of humanity, but I suggest it's an accurate one. And I think we all know that it is. Right? The question that he asks is, where does our care for others come from? But the evidence of this is, of course, the great tragedy several months ago in Sri Lanka. I was writing this presentation when this happened. And I had just gone to my in-laws in North Carolina, and the airlines for the 27,000th time had lost my luggage. And I was furious. And I had, you know, like any person who travels on Northwest, brought an extra pair of slacks in my carry-on, because I knew it was going to happen, but I was still angry. And then I saw this on the news, and I had to force myself to watch it. I had to force myself to feel it. I had to really pay attention and remind myself that this wasn't television. In a sense, I had to make myself get depressed. But then I thought, you know what? This is horrible, but I have a North Dakota Humanities Council deadline on January 1st, and I have to finish this presentation. And so I turned off the TV, and I sat on my laptop, and I wrote the presentation, and then my luggage arrived, and I was in a good mood. <laughs> Would we sacrifice these people for our little finger? Of course not. The philosopher wants to know why not. And the philosopher wants to know what is going on in the human psyche that our passive emotions, our passive sentiments, our passive principles are what they are but we would never do that. And if it is the case that we wouldn't sacrifice these people, what has to happen for us to care, right? Okay, we don't sacrifice the people for our little finger, but what do we have to do to care? What do we have to do to go to Sri Lanka and help them, to give the largest charity donation we've ever given, to make a priority of the United States of America, or of Bismarck, of our, or of our household, to help others in need. 
What has to happen for us to care? The way I want you to understand Smith's work is to understand that the theory of moral sentiments sets up a moral foundation a foundation of moral psychology, of how we think about things, of how we act, of how we make moral principles. And the wealth of nations is an example of a sphere of human experience. It is the economic and the political sphere, because the wealth of nations is not just about markets, it's also about governments, how a government is to be structured. I want you to think about how theory of moral sentiments can complement the wealth of nations, and the wealth of nations can complement the theory of moral sentiments, because Smith, at least in my reading of him, clearly thought they were part and parcel of the same project. And what I will spend the rest of the time showing you is the ways in which they overlap, and the ways in which the theory of moral sentiments, this sympathy-motivated moral psychology, interacts with the wealth of nations this self-interested economic conception of how freedom works together with economic benefits. Smith is concerned with equity and economic fairness. In the Wealth of Nations, he says, servants and laborers and workmen of different kinds make up the far greater part of every great political society. The most people are the workers. They're not the aristocracies. They're not the government. They're not, you know, the rich, they're the workers. But what improves the circumstance of the greatest part can never be regarded as an inconvenience to the whole. Meaning, that which benefits the workers is to the benefit of everybody. This is the wealth of nations. This is self-interest here. It is better to benefit everybody than just a few small group of, a, a small group of people. He continues, no society can surely be flourishing and happy by which the far greater part of its members are poor and miserable. We cannot have a happy society if most of the members are unhappy. But that's, that's a utilitarian conception. Utilitarianism, uh, utilitarianism is the moral philosophy that argues that we should, have the, we should act so as to maximize the greatest good for the greatest number of people. So, you know, if I'm sacrificing myself, or right, some, and let's hope I'm not, you know, suggesting things about to happen, some gunman comes in and says, I'm going to shoot all of you, or I'm going to shoot the speaker. You know, if I'm a moral person under utilitarianism, I'm going to have to say, well, I sacrifice myself for the great many people in the room. Logic dictates it. Smith was, at he was at times utilitarian, but ultimately he's not. Notice, he says, and I have it highlighted, it is but equity besides. He means justice there. It is justice. It is morality. It is proper action that they who feed, clothe, and lodge the whole body of the people should have such a share of the produce of their own labor, it's anticipating Marx right there, the produce of their own labor, as to be themselves tolerably well-fed, clothed, and lodged. It is justice that the people who work for our goods get those goods. It is justice that the people who work hard care, are cared for. It is justice and equity that the people who strive get what they deserve. This is not utilitarian, and this is not self-interest. This is moral philosophy at its finest. Smith is also concerned with education. The most vulgar education teaches us to act upon all important occasions with some sort of impartiality between ourselves and others. Let me stop here for a second. I want you to ask yourself, how do you know what the moral thing to do is? How do you understand what's right and what's wrong? We read it in books. We see it on television. Our family members tell us. We learn from our own experience. There is a debate right now in contemporary America as to the place and the importance of, pop, of, of public education. Do we give tax money to public schools? Or do we send our children to private schools, to parochial schools? Do, create, do we create vouchers in which people get to choose? Do we have one set of standards 
for all the country? Or do we have different standards for different cities? How do we measure those standards? Let's think about No Child Left Behind for a second. Part of what No Child Left Behind suggests is that we have mandatory tests to determine if children meet standards. What this tells us is that a successful education is regurgitation of facts. You have to know what date X happened. You have to know which person said Y. Smith, in a long line of thinkers, tells us that education is about judgment. And education is the primary vehicle for morality. And notice he's not saying religious education. And he's not talking about prayer in schools and those sorts of things, although that could be part of the conversation. What he's saying is that education teaches us the impartiality between ourselves and our others. The purpose of education is to make you understand, and this is going to be a harsh way to put it, but the, the education's job is to make us understand that we are not so special, that we are not so much more important than anyone else. We are special. In 21st century America, we all want to know we're unique, right? We're all special people. We all have human rights and human value. He's not denying that. But as I tell my students all the time, what the philosophers want us to understand in moral philosophy is that the rules that apply to everyone else apply to us. The rules that apply to us apply to everyone else. That's where impartiality comes in. When I make a judgment, I have to understand that I'm not just making a judgment for myself, I'm making a judgment for all sorts of other people as well. And even the ordinary commerce of the world is capable of adjusting our active principles to some degree of propriety. Even, you know, everyday interaction, basic education, basic interaction, is going to give us some sense of what's moral and what's not. But, and there's a but right there, but it is the most artificial and refined education only. He means strict right there. He means institutional, strict, disciplined education. And I have, I have one student in the room right now who has survived, I think, seven of my classes. And she has suffered through some strict education. But it is the most artificial and refined education only, it has been said, which can correct the inequalities of our passive feelings. And we must, for this purpose, it has been pretended, have recourse to the severest. We must have strong education. Now, Smith is not a true Democrat in the sense that, that's little d, not big d, in the sense that he thinks education has to be identical for everyone. As we're going to say, as we're going to talk about, some people have more education than others. What is key here? is that the government is going to have a responsibility to educate its populace. The public can facilitate this acquisition, the acquisition of morality, by establishing in every parish, that's district, or school, or district, a little school where children may be taught for rewards so moderate that even a common laborer may afford it. The, the country, the nation, has a responsibility to fund public education to such an extent that even the poorest person can send their children to school. They may not be able to go all the way to university, but they have to have some access to public education. Why? Notice this is not going to be an economic argument. And this is in the wealth of nations. A man without the proper use of the intellectual faculties of a man is, and there's no evidence suggested in Smith that he only meant men here, by the way. It was 18th century uh, nomenclature to say man instead of men and women or people, but he meant both. A man without proper use of the intellectual faculties of a man is, if possible, more contemptible than even a coward, and seems to be mutilated and deformed in a still more essential part of the character of human nature. A person who is not intellectually developed, a person who does not have their intellectual capacities, a person who is not educated, is worse than a coward, and doesn't have their full human nature. Though the state were, was to derive no advantage from the instruction of the inferior ranks of people, and that's just class language, meaning the poor, 
it would still deserve its attention that they should not be altogether uninstructive. That again is a moral argument. Even if we were not to get a benefit from educating everyone, remember equity, justice, would still demand. But the state, however, derives no inconsiderable advantage from their instruction. This is a heck of a claim. An instru instructed and intelligent people besides are always more decent and orderly than an ignorant and stupid. An educated society is a better society. An educated society is a more moral society. An educated society is a more orderly society. Smith spends a great deal of time in the Wealth of Nations talking about Greece and Rome and using their education as an example of societies that he thinks were constructed for the moral behavior. So for those who argue that the wealth of nations is purely selfish, purely egoistic, purely market-oriented. I give you claim number one, Smith's assertion about the importance of public education. Let's look at claim number two. Oh, sorry, footnote. Compare this with Mandeville's claim. This is wonderful. Compare this with Mandeville's assertion about education. You may compel the poor to labor without force. So by bringing them up in ignorance, you may, uh, oh, type of it. you may inure them to real hardship without being ever sensible themselves that they are such. By bringing them up in ignorance, I mean no more as I have intended long ago that as the worldly affairs, their knowledge should be confined with the verge of their own occupations. <coughs> Mandeville's argument was never educate the poor. Because if you educate the poor, they know that they're suffering and they won't be happy being poor. Keep the poor stupid, and you don't have to worry about them taking your money. That's a heck of a contrast to Smith. Now Smith talks about religion. Still ultimately education. The interest and active zeal of religious teachers can be dangerous and troublesome only when there is either but one sect tolerated in society, or where the whole of a large society is divided into two or three great sects, the teachers of each acting by consort and under a regular discipline and subordination. If you look at 18th century writing, if you look at the writing of our founding fathers, our founding parents, I should say, you'll see that what concerned Jefferson, Madison, etc., is factionalism. The dividing up of groups, where people have loyalty to those groups instead of the country. So, Smith is saying, both in terms of religion and in terms of faction, imagine if we only had two groups. Imagine if we only had two dominant groups in our society. And this one group, group A, was incredibly loyal to that group, and this one group, group B, is incredibly the other. Let's say, you know, I don't know, let's assign them colors. Right? So let's say A wears only red, and B wears only blue. If we had this imaginary division in our society, could anything get done? <coughs> Could people agree on anything? Could people think about the good of the community or the country before they thought about the goods of their own group? Would religions be concerned only about the interest of their religion? Or would they be concerned with the good of men? So Smith believed in absolute political and religious freedom. Well, let me say. Smith believed in encouraging religious freedom. Why? Because the zeal must be altogether innocent where the society is divided into two or three hundred or perhaps into as many as thousand small sects of which no one could be considered enough to disturb the basic tranquility. What is the solution to religious factionalism? Let everyone have their own religion. And let's not have three or four major denominations with 500 million people in them or 40 million people in them that have political power. But let's encourage everyone to have lots of different religions. So we've got 50 people here and 50 people there and 100 people there. And let's not just have one political party, let's have 50 political parties here, there, or the other. Because then one group of people is going to be small enough that they're not going to be able to do any real damage. Now, of course, this was before the nuclear bomb. And an individual now can do a lot of damage if they get access to mass, you know, weapons of mass destruction. Or, you know, a computer virus. But nevertheless, his point is, Religious zeal, political zeal, factionalism has to be subordinate to the good of the community. Also, 
not egoist, even though it's in the wealth of nations. Then he says something interesting. He says, education has to be understood in terms of the whole human experience. And part of what happens when people come, let's say, to big cities, or when people feel isolated, is they have nothing to do. They have nothing to do, they have nothing to think about. So they become attracted to lunatics. They become attracted to people who bring out their fanaticism. You don't have anything to do? Come join, you know, my religious group. We get to do whatever we want. Oh, this is boring? Well, let's make it more exciting. Make our claims more and more and more extreme. So we need something to do. The state, by encouraging that, is by giving entire liberty to all those who, for their own interest, would attempt without scandal or decently to amuse and divert the people. This is interesting. The government's responsibility is to amuse and divert the people by painting, poetry, music, dancing, follow that symbol, and by all sorts of dramatic representations, plays, and exhibitions would easily dissipate in the greater part of them that melancholy and gloomy humor which is almost always the nurse of popular superstition and enthusiasm. Give people art, and they will be happy. Give people art, and they will be educated. Give people poetry, and theater, and drama, and they will not become fanatics. And thus Smith justifies the North Dakota Humanities Council. <laughs> There's always a punchline. What's this point is, we're not here just because it's interesting. We're not here just because it's something to do in, in Bismarck on the plains. We're not here just because nothing better to do. I mean, this may be interesting. I hope this has been interesting. But that's not all this is. By being here, we are also being and learning how to be better citizens. The arts and humanities are necessary for a stable and a just political society. The more art we have, the more theater, the more poetry, the more books, the more creativity we have as a public activity, the better our society is. So what is this answer to Mandeville? Self-interest is not selfishness. Don't confuse the two. Economic works in conjunction with social structures. Free market is incredibly important, and I do not mean to demean, I do not mean to demean the importance of the free market. But it does not work alone. You need education, you need arts and humanities, you need all these different things. Education is necessary. Care for others is necessary. Factionalism and fanaticism destroy society, and of course the arts and humanities are necessary. So what is Smith's challenge to us? We have to see through the myths that surround life. We have to see past greed. We have to see the other aspects of life in Smith's free market. We have to care for those far away, even in Sri Lanka, even in China, just as we care for those near and dear to us. We have to build a strong public education system. We have to support the arts. We have to temper individuality and community. And that's this answer to us, and that's what Gordon Gekko got wrong. The United States is not a community, sorry, it's not a corporation, it is a community. We are not individuals who greed for, with, greed, with desire for life that's greed. We do not have greed for life, we do not have greed for love, we do not have greed for knowledge. We are individuals and a community, and that is much more than the caricature of Adam Smith that most of us have learned in school. Thank you very much. It's a lot to think about, I know, um, but I'm happy to entertain any questions. And please feel free not only to ask uh, Feel free to challenge my assertion. Feel free also to ask questions uh, for further clarification if I said something that was too quick or, or, or that you want uh, more information about. I have a question.
Sure. Uh, going back to the, you know, earlier you were talking about how one group was trying to put Christmas back into uh, the economy. Um, the question I have is, is are the corporations caving to take out Christmas due to a small group, and what is their, what is their reason since the entire country wants Christ mentioned in Christmas? Why are the, the large corporations taking out in answer to a small group? The, the question is about my initial comments, and, my, and, and the question is as follows, if I understand it. Why are the corporations motivated to take Christ out of Christmas if, as the, the speaker suggests, um, everyone uh, you know, in the country wants Christ to be in it, and what motivates them to do so? One of the benefits of capitalism is that my money is as good as your money and your money is as good as everyone else's money. And so, since every dollar is equal to every other dollar, I as a consumer can be, at least from the monetary perspective, just as important as you. What the corporations understand is that the question that you ask isn't entirely accurate, because it's not the entire country that wants that. First of all, many Christians themselves don't have a problem with the commercialism of, of, of Christmas. What Christianity is is very complicated with lots and lots of different denominations, not just the uh, Catholic-Protestant uh, dichotomy, but also Unitarians and Episcopalians and Baptists and all that sort of thing. But, and even though they're not as represented in North Dakota as they are represented elsewhere, there are lots and lots and lots of other religious groups in the United States. And what the corporations are responding to is the fact that Jews shop as well, and Buddhists shop as well, and Muslims shop as well. And by saying, by focusing only on the Christian aspect of the holiday, a holiday where there's also Hanukkah, right, where there's also um, Kwanzaa, right, um, that they want the whole market. And so what we see in the corporations there is that, that cross, that, that overlap between democracy and uh, capitalism, where it seems to be working, at least from my perspective, well. And that's why I use that example of, of bringing Christ back to Christmas, because what those groups were saying was the Muslims, the Jews, the, the, the Christians who share different attitudes, they're not as important. And so that's why the corporations were doing it. Most corporations, and there are exceptions, most corporations aren't out for evil. They're out to make money. And this is the truth in Gecko's comment, the tempered truth, the moderate truth, which is, if we want to cater to the whole market and get as many people as possible, we're going to get the minorities as well as the majorities. And what we see in California, for example, is that collectively, minority population is now more than the, what is traditionally called the majority population. And so if you, um, if you limit it to just one group, the market uh, disappears. May I redirect? Sure. Uh, I'm just asking because I'm trying to understand. Sure. If Christmas is a Christian holiday, then they're trying to take, then by them trying to take out Christ out of Christmas, isn't necessarily going to help a Jew who does not uh, uh, celebrate Christmas so are they going to be able to, to reach out to the Jewish sector of the country over December 25, which the Jews don't recognize? Or are they just trying to, to create it so that it covers any holiday throughout the year? Um, I, I think that they're certainly doing the latter. Right? I think that they're trying to cater to every holiday and to, to let as many people in as possible. Right? Thank you. Um, I also think that... Uh, What's worth investigating, of course, because markets are part of our culture and corporations are part of our culture, it's worth investigating what Christmas has become in our culture. <laughs> there are those who say that, you know, this group wants uh, Christ put back in Christmas, but biblical scholars have shown time and time again that Christ was actually born in September. And so why don't we celebrate Christmas in September? Where does Santa Claus come in? Where does the Christmas tree come in? Where does gift giving come in? We're not giving people frankincense and myrrh, and of course, we're not giving gifts to the Messiah anyway, so where does the gift giving come in? So the whole concept of Christmas as a gift giving holiday 
is so intertwined with secular notions and political notions that it becomes very hard to identify it as a purely religious holiday. And that's what the corporations are responding to. I saw a hand here. Yeah. Uh, it's a very good question. The question is, some scholars have argued that capitalism caused 9-11. Um, let me say a couple things. The first is, Smith, Smith actually never used the word capitalism. Smith used free market. Capital is a word that comes out in the late 19th century, um, and its most uh, widest use is actually the, the point where it became into the popular consciousness was when Max Weber in the early 20th century published the Protestant Ethics and, and, uh, and capitalism. I am reluctant to say that there is what we what we call what what's being called a conflict of cultures, because the Muslim world, most of the Muslim world, and most Muslims live in many ways that are similar to us. They have computers. They have internet. They drive cars, they watch movies, they go to restaurants. The vast majority of Muslims in the world are much more similar to America than they are to Americans, non-Muslim Americans, than they are different. So it's a gross simplification, as this scholar says, that capitalism costs. It. Now, with that said, Let's look at what Smith precisely would say. Smith would say, what's happening in the world is that capitalism is forgetting the social structures that we've talked about, the mandatory education, the care for others, the ways to temper religious fanaticism, the arts and humanity. And as such, if we lived in a society that cared for other people around the globe, then it is at least plausible to think that those people might be happier than they are now and might, and I say might, might not have done what they did on September 11th. Whether they were justified or not, whether they you know, were crazy or not, whether or not they had good religious reasons or not, these are questions I'm not answering. But what I will say is they probably weren't happy. They probably weren't satisfied. And so one question that we can ask, and I think the Sri Lankan example is a good example of this, is what can we do as a society, as a country, as people in this room, as people in Bismarck, as people in North Dakota, as people in the United States, what can we do to help people around the world independent of what country, independent of what religion they are? And that's, of course, the answer that Smith would give. That if we have capitalism without the support structures, it becomes a very dangerous weapon and people are going to lash out against it. If we have capitalism with the support structures, then we may very well find that the cosmopolitan vision of a world that lives together and happy and harmony with religious and political differences is achievable. I think that's what Smith would say. Yes? Um, in the US, it seems like Smith has been in a trivially large what, what do uh, Europeans or people in other countries think of Smith? Um, the question is, in the United States, and this seems to be trivial, trivialized, um, what do Europeans think of Smith? What I'm talking about here, this is, I'm, I'm hoping this is going to be a satisfying answer, because this is going to be a philosopher's answer. And, 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 and it's, it may sound like I'm sort of backdooring it, but I don't intend to. And you can follow up on it. Please, if I, if I don't address it well. What I'm trying to do is, is, is focus on a point in, in what, I would, what, what gets called our intellectual tradition, right? um, and to see where we might have gone wrong. So capitalism, of course, is much, much more than Smith. Many, many more economists, many more political scientists, many more philosophers have built on capitalism. So by, by going to the beginning, I'm hoping to show that even the founder of capitalism or the most famous purveyor of capitalism, 
Even him we get wrong. Europeans have a wide ranging understanding of what capitalism is. Scandinavian countries, which many people in, in this part of the, the country are descended from, have a much more social democratic conception of, of capitalism, which means there is a free market, but the free market allows for things like free health care, free education, two years off for, um, uh, for parents, uh, for one parent of a newborn, things that we in this country don't have. I suspect that that's more in line with what Smith had in mind. But I'm always very cautious about answering, you know, what would Smith say about last Tuesday? Because he lived in such a different world that it's hard to know. And I also want to distinguish between Smith, the person who may have been, you know, a jerk, right? And Smith, the per and, and, and Smith, the theory, right? So. Europeans, let's say in Scandinavia and places like um, Austria and France and Germany, they have a much more social democratic system. Places like England, Canada are somewhere in between. So what I think you get is different versions of capitalism in terms of how they react to Smith himself or his theories himself then what I'm very lucky to be doing my work during a time when there's a revival of interest in Smith as a philosopher. And that's happened over the last 15 years. And actually, even in the last five or 10, it's been the most intense. And I know that there have been some very, very good books that have come out of Europe um, to help us figure out what exactly Smith says and what the consequences are. So as a, as a, as a philosopher, there's a revival of interest as sort of representative of the capitalist uh, theory, you have these wide-ranging different interpretations of, what, of how much capitalism is accepted. I hope that answered your question. Yes? I'm trying to figure out what the invisible hand is, as you were talking about the invisible hand. And I heard you say sentiment, which was what Hume thought about. Hume gave up on the God business, judgment of God, as a thing that that drives us, that, that, that makes things work. We're looking for something else. Uh, as I try to understand what sentiment is, I'm guessing as a listen to you that it could be something like we don't live in this world by ourselves. We have to pay attention to the fact that we are human with all of us human beings. And therefore, human trying to hold things together with, with, instead of the God business with the people, the people. It, it, it's a very good question. And it's a, it's, it's a, a, a sophisticated question spoken from someone who, who, who's read Hume, of which um, I wish we all had. Um, let me rephrase the question, and then, and then I'll, I'll answer it. And, and, and please keep me honest if I'm, if I'm representing your question in accurately. There's a philosopher who came right before Smith named David Hume, who uses the concept of sympathy and sentiment before Smith. What do I mean when I use the term sympathy and sentiment, and what do I mean when I use the term impartial spectator? How do they relate to another, and how does that relate to the work of David Hume? Is that a fair interpretation? Good. Let me say a couple, I'll, I'll tell you some gossip, and then I'll give you some background, and then I'll provide the answer. The gossip. Smith and Hume were best friends. Smith and Hume, uh, Hume was older than Smith. Smith read Hume's, dial, uh, Hume's inquiry in, in university. It was, for, it was discouraged, if not forbidden. He got in trouble for it. Uh, but they met. They became very, very good friends. Smith thought he was going to die, made Hume the executor of his will. Um, but Hume ended up dying before Smith, though Smith became the executor of Hume's will. Irony of irony. <laughs> When Smith died, he had 13 volumes of unpublished work that he ordered burnt because Smith was, for lack of a better term, unbelievably anal retentive and didn't want anyone to look at his work that was not published. That's the gospel. The background. Hume and Smith are both Scottish Enlightenment thinkers. And the Scottish Enlightenment had a very different conception of what God, how God operated than then peace, then a large group, then people tend to think of God in the contemporary world, right? 
right? In the contemporary world, there's this whole discussion of creationism versus evolution and science versus religion. The Scots would not have thought in those ways. Scots pursued what they called natural religion. And what natural religion meant was the following. This is all God's creation. And insofar as this is God's creation, we learn about God by learning about the world around us. That means we learn about science, we're learning about God. We learn about sociology, we're learning about God. Hume, however, was an atheist. And Hume, as this gentleman has said, got rid of all that God business. Now, the second you get rid of all that God business, you have to find another way to ground moral theory. This is not what Dostoevsky said that you know when God is, is, is absent, all is, all is permitted. It's not that. Many of the great moral theories do not invoke God at all. Kant, a German Enlightenment figure, is an example of one. So Hume said the following. First, he said, we have this capacity to sympathize with others. We have these sentiments. And that when we look at humanity, we have, when we envision humanity as a whole, a sympathetic response to the goods of the human race. So that even if individually I may not like you very much, and I you know, want to kick you in the shin, or I want you know, something bad to happen to someone over here, if I think about humanity as a whole, I want good things to happen to humanity. The second thing he said, which Smith is building on, is he says famously, reason is the slave to the passions. And here's what that means. We often think that what we need to do, in order, in order to do the right thing, we have to know what the right thing to do is. Right? We have to know whether it's right or wrong to kill someone. We have to know whether it's right or wrong to commit adultery. We have to know whether it's right or wrong to lie. But Hume says that's not enough. We not only have to know what the right thing to do is, we have to be motivated to do the right thing. Right? You can lean a horse to water, but you can't make him drink. So Hume sets up a problem that Smith needs to solve. First, what is the emotional connection with human beings? Second, how do we motivate people to do the right thing even when we know when the right thing to do is? Now, here's the beginning of the answer to your question. The invisible hand, which is a quasi-religious metaphor, and my wife, um, I think she, she uh, my wife always says that every time I use the phrase invisible hand, I should go, the invisible hand, because right? it's this weird mystical, mystical notion. What does it mean? We're not sure. Okay. First, what it probably means is the notion of progress. The Enlightenment philosophers had an incredible optimistic notion that human race was getting better. And therefore, left to its own devices, the world of 50 years from now or the world from 100 years from now will be better than the world it is now. Um, the classic example of, of a philosopher talking about progress in this way, Immanuel Kant has an essay called What is Enlightenment? That is the classic example. So what Smith is doing with the invisible hand is taking this notion of progress and reducing it to the economy. And saying, if we are all individually focused on our self-interest, it will all collectively together move towards progress. Here's the way to understand that in our contemporary society. If you take how we're told to vote, what we're told to do is to go into the election booth and vote for what we want. I'm not concerned with what my neighbor wants. I'm not concerned with what you know any of you want. I vote for what I want. You vote for what you want. And in the end, the best person will end up being president. That's a version of the invisible hand. Let's contrast this with Jean-Jacques Rousseau's conception, which loosely explained is as follows. When everyone goes into the voting booth, what they're supposed to do is they're supposed to vote for what they think is best for the community, not what's best for their individual. And everyone collectively voting for the community will discover what's best for the community. It's a different vision. So what the, invi what the invisible hand is, is a notion of progress. Now, there's some things that I didn't emphasize when I gave my description of the invisible hand. The first is, what Smith says What Smith says in, in both of the and third law sentences is if we let the invisible hand govern the market, Goods will be divided up equally as if God had divided, nature had divided up itself. Right? So, so it, 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 okay, so we all spend whatever money we want, in the end we're all going to get, you know, the same amount of money. That's, you know, patently false. Right? 
But that's okay, because that's not really what Smith said. What Smith did was distinguish between what he called necessaries and conveniences, or what we would call necessities and luxuries. Smith says, if everyone focuses on their self-interest, everyone will have the basic necessities, but some people will have more luxuries than others. But this is still patently false. So that's where sympathy comes in. What I suggest is that what Smith does is say, the market will only give everyone necessities if we have sympathetic affection for one another. And so we only care if we can care for each other as the people, as you so eloquently said. If we have that Jeffersonian notion that we have a responsibility towards the community and we care for other people, then we will help the market move along its progression as if the invisible hand is guiding it, and the consequence will be what Smith calls universal opulence. Universal opulence is Smith's way of saying the poor get better off. The rich may get better off too, but the poor get better off, so no one is bad off. And that's how they're, they're connected. And so for people who didn't follow, let me just summarize. The connection between sympathy and the impartial spectator is basically what I've been trying to say all along, which is economics, the free market, only works if, in addition to competition, we also have care for one another. Care and competition are not in opposition, or to use uh, ironic terminology, care and competition are not in competition with each other, but rather care and competition work together to supplement one another to create a situation of justice and stability. Is that fair? Thank you for an excellent question. I have a question. Sure. Uh, back to Smith's thought experiment that you talked about, and it resulted in like those passive feelings and then the active principles. How do you, how do you me as an individual, I find the solution in that through Smith's challenges that you gave us at the end is the solution to that paradox of active and active principles and passive feelings. But how do I, as an individual, start to do something about that? It's a good question. The question is, going back to the example of the thought experiment, the China example, or as I talk about the Sri Lankan example, how do we as individuals do something about helping others? And how do we get past this notion that our passive feelings that are, you know, that are, 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 are so dominant? And how do we cultivate our active feelings? How do we cultivate the care for others? There are lots of non-Smithian answers, right? You know, volunteer a nonprofit organization and all of that sort of stuff, right? Give charity, all that sort of thing. But here's what Smith would say. And this is again a philosopher's answer. And philosopher's answers are sometimes more ambiguous than we want. Aristotle said, Aristotle famously said, you can never expect the same precision from ethics that you would from mathematics. And if you and if you if you want that same kind of conclusion, you're gonna you know, be disappointed for what that's a paragraph. Um, now, what Smith said, would say is some version of the following, I think. In our experiences, in the movies we watch, in the television shows we see, in the books we read, we see suffering all the time. Some of the suffering is real, some of the suffering is made up. And so we become, to a certain extent, desensitized. Meaning, I see those images of the children starving, and I think, boy, that's sad, and I move on. So what Smith would have us do is have us engage in, in, in the process of forcing ourselves to think about someone as an individual. And, and this is slightly different, say, than Hume's answer, which is to think of us each as a human, as a member of the human race. Think of us as an individual and enter into my perspective. Here, let me give you some background. Smith says the following. I want to sympathize with a father who's lost his son. I do not, in order to do this, ask myself, how would I feel if I were a father and I lost my son, my, my son was killed? How, how would I feel? I do not ask that. I ask instead, how would, I, um, how would I feel if I were this particular father and I were this particular, and I lost this particular son? 
What Smith does, perhaps better than any other philosopher, although a claim like that you know, will get me in trouble instantaneously, what Smith does virtually better than any other philosopher is focus on the role of the imagination. And what Smith wants you to do is the following. Use your imagination to ask, what is this individual in the picture actually feeling? What is this individual in the picture actually experiencing? And give yourself up to that imaginative leap, and then act on what you think is appropriate. Because what Smith thinks is that since we have that common humanity, which is inherited from you, by entering into the perspective of that individual, you will figure out, given what you have access to, how to best help them. And that means send them money, tell your friends and have a, a uh, can drive, um, volunteer at a local a women's shelter, you know, whatever thing it is. So the goal is to push away from the, the I'll use a big term here, the enforced otherness, right? We are constantly forced to make other people into others. They're different than us. They're not our concern. What Smith wants us to do is use our imagination to enter into that situation, to genuinely feel for that person and to act and then look and see what resources we have on and us. You know, I mean, when you're in Bismarck, North Dakota, you cannot go and volunteer at the United Nations. Because right? there's no UN here. But you can do other things. And that's, and that's the best answer that Smith is going to give us. I hope that that's satisfying. Or at least leads to more. Other questions? If I'm not seeing a hand, please someone just ask. Because I. It, it's a good question. Um, uh, the question is, how would Smith respond to this issue of outsourcing and the decimation of the middle class? It's actually, this is a conversation I've had with my wife a dozen times because she's asking the same question over and over and over again. So I think you're a plant, basically. <laughs> um, I'm not going to respond to the decimation of the middle class because I'm not qualified to sort of engage in public policy. But this is what Smith would say. And actually, let me back this up with, 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 with an assertion of fact about public, public policy, which I just said that I'm good, not qualified to say. All the studies have shown that during periods of heavy immigration, the economy is stronger and better. So all of the people who say, let's not let immigrants in because we are, um, we're losing jobs to them, and this is not your direct question, but it's, it's background for it. Um, they're, they're, they're going at it backwards. And this is, of course, Smith's response to mercantilism, too. Right? Let immigrants in, because studies have shown that the more immigration we have, the stronger uh, the economy. Why? Because immigrants in our country will do the jobs that most of us don't want to do. New immigrants without education, without connections to the community, who are desperately trying to survive, will be the dishwashers. We'll scrub our toilets. We'll do all of these things. And then the people who have done those things will move up the ladder because they have more connections. Now, how does this respond to outsourcing? If we look at individual people's experiences, then someone's going to suffer. You work in a factory, in a Ford factory. The Ford factory goes to Mexico. That's the only job you can get. As an individual, you're out of luck. Some people will have to suffer unless we have support systems for further education, for charity, for all those sorts of things, and then, and then there, there's help. But if we look collectively at the economy, what we will see is that although individual people will suffer here and there, overall, there will be better jobs due to outsourcing because the assembly jobs, uh, let's say the working on, on, on an assembly line jobs, will go to Mexico. And then if the government, if the government is working properly, and if the market is working properly, and if education is working properly, I'm a philosopher, I get to use all these ifs. If all of these things happen, then the options that the people get for replacement jobs will be superior to the job that they lost. Again, there will be people who suffer. But as a general rule, 
the people jobs will be better off. So the response to outsourcing that Smith would get, and this, I, and, and let me emphasize again and again, he's doing political economy, he's not doing economics, right? Which means that he's not only concerned with economics, he's concerned with political science and sociology and anthropology. What Smith says is, if we have outsourcing and the economy is purely capitalist without any support system, we're all out of luck. But if we can create an economy which allows for good education and all of these other things that he's talked about, then all of that will work collectively to raise the bottom up so that we're helping Mexico by giving them the forward job and we're helping ourselves by getting better jobs. But in order to do that, we have to have a government that caters not only to the economic sphere, but the educational sphere and the personal sphere and all of those things. Smith is not a utopian, right? Despite the invisible hand. Smith is constantly reminding us that, that the real life is going to fall short. And so the job is to do the best we can, and sometimes we can only do the best we can. Other questions? Again, if I don't see I someone. I have yeah. a I was wondering, you talked about Smith said that it was the government's responsibility to amuse and divert people from fanaticism through things such as the humanities, paintings, etc. And I was wondering if our government accepted that responsibility through cable television. Um, I, I always do my best not to reveal my, my political leanings in these discussions. So here is what I will say. Certainly the role of C-SPAN and public access television is an example of the government accepting that responsibility. The National Endowment for the Humanities and the National Endowment for the Arts is an example of that responsibility. Um, Pell Grants, Stafford Loans, federal funding of universities, state funding of universities is an example of that responsibility. What I will say is this. The percentage of the defense budget that gets taken up by the National Endowment for the Humanities is minuscule. A question that you have to ask yourself as a voter is whether that's the proper proportion. Whether or not the government is, by having a small budget for the NEH or the NEA, or by only having public access television, is that enough to accept that responsibility? That's a question for you as a voter, or you as a citizen. I can tell you, as a philosopher, as a presenter, that yes, absolutely, these are examples of taking on that responsibility. You then have to ask, is that enough? And I can't answer that for you. Is that fair? Sure. Where do we stand then as a, a nation, 200 years old, in compared to other nations that have stood tests of time? with the investment in the arts, endowments, education, wouldn't you say we're pretty high on the uh, investment list? Yet I would still actually suggest, well, we're criticized for our, uh, you know, being selfish as an American group. Um, <clears throat> part of the problem in looking back at history and making, the, the question is, sorry, the question is, how do we compare in contemporary America uh, in terms of uh, support for the arts, for example, in, in terms of other uh, periods of history and other governments? Um, it's always very, very hard to compare time period to time period. Because of course, the Borgias gave a lot more money to the arts comparatively than our current administration, but the Borgias also were, you know, aristocrats and, and you know, totalitarian leaders, for lack of a better term, and, 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 and so they did lots of other things badly. Right? Um, also, we look back at the Rembrandts and the Monets and, 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 the, and you know, even George O'Keefe, even though you know, she's an American, um, and we know that a lot of them were not funded by the equivalent 